Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. Today I'm coming to you from the beautiful Cedarville University campus in Cedarville, Ohio. I came here for the Ninth International Conference on Creationism. I had to get up early to film this. I had to come out before the construction crews arrived because they were building a massive number of buildings on campus. But also, once this conference kicks in this morning, I'm going to be doing nothing but talking all day long. I have talked more in the last couple of days than I've probably talked in the last several months. There are so many cool people to meet, so many great ideas floating around, so many encouraging comments. I gave my presentation yesterday uh, that I shared with you several months ago on the phylogenetic versus a genealogical mutation race and why that's such a tremendous problem for evolution. I've listened to some amazing presentations. There are some controversial ideas floating around. I mean, there's some, you know, arguing about where the flood, post-flood boundary was, arguing over the role of natural selection, whether it's true or not, which of course I think it is true, uh, things like that. But it's all in all a really productive, really um, excellent week. In fact, there was a a long discussion we had yesterday on feathered dinosaurs or not feathered dinosaurs and whether or not they can fit in the creation model or are we accepting evolution if we say that they have feathers. And oh, that was really well done. And so I'm encouraged. This is not your grandpa's creationism. This is a new thing. We have supercomputers. We have molecular models. We have uh, decades of theory. We have all this work and all these coming together and people uh, b bouncing ideas off of each other. And we're growing significantly. This is the largest conference that we've ever had. And the, the, there's a palpable uh, feeling of urgency here, specifically in the realm of genetics. So that's my bridge into the, the title of this episode, Eschatological Genetics. Now, eschatology is that branch of theology that deals with end times. I don't get into end times on this channel. I have my own personal views. Every time I study it out, I basically come to the same conclusions that I've always had. I'm not even going to tell you what they are. Just, just know that it's one of the classic... Uh, end times views of Christianity. Maybe not the most dominant one, but definitely one of the classic ones. Eschatology deals with end times. Eschatological genetics deals with how our understanding of genes under, uh, influences our understanding of what's coming in the future. Because in evolutionary theory, natural selection can operate on organisms or maybe gene duplications or, or in... Uh, matings between species or maybe a, a change of a Hox gene or something like that. So either way, natural selection plus any other mechanism an evolutionist wants to invoke, they look at things as a progress, as an upward trend, as things improving over time, as humans evolving from, you know, primitive forest dwellers that could only crack nuts open with a rock and now we're flying to the moon. But in the biblical world, we don't see it that way. You see, in the biblical world, the world we live in is cursed. The curse is not natural to the world. It's something applied to the world after the fact. It's causing all things to decay over time. And so we're looking at things as getting worse, not getting better. And we're like, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come soon. Come back to this earth before it's too late. Because according to the models that we're looking at and the data and the, the accumulation curves of genetics, we're not going to be around for millions of years. So Christ has to come back before millions of years from now when humanity is not going to be functional anymore because of the rate of mutation accumulation. So let me give you three big reasons why genetics is eschatological. Uh, the first is the thing that I presented to you several months ago, genealogy versus phylogeny, the war continues. It is clear that the mutation rate is too fast for evolutionary theory to handle. Natural selection cannot remove most of the mutations. Genetic drift only operates in small populations, and even though 99.99 something percent of all new mutations will be lost due to just a random chance, you have a large number of ancestors. So even if the probability of you inheriting that mutation from some ancestor is very low, the number of ancestors you have means that the mutation rate equals the mutation accumulation rate. Natural selection can only remove a small fraction of those. So therefore, the Mutation accumulation rate is linear with respect to the mutation rate that we can measure, and it's way too high. We as a species are doomed. The second aspect of eschatological genetics deals with genetic entropy. Just the thought that all things are declining over time, and we can see that in the genes of organisms, in the DNA of organisms. When we sequence things, we see things falling apart, not improving. Just about every example of natural selection that I can think of involves a gene that broke. Something doesn't work anymore, so now the transporter can't transmit the uh, antibiotic into the bacterial cell, or the, the, um, the red blood cell 
is sickle because of the crystalline structure of the hemoglobin that doesn't exist in normal people, but people with a sickle cell anemia trait, their, their red blood cell sickle, well, you know what, that protects them against malaria. But it's still a downward, downhill, bad change. Almost all changes are like that. Now, we do see some uh, genomic duplication, specifically in plants, like so rice, corn, a lot of other um, of crop plants. There's a duplication, so the genetics is running wild. It's producing too much starch. Well, okay, that's good for us. Not necessarily good for the plant. I don't think the wild type would ever do that. And, and I don't think the wild type plants can maintain that starch production. It's too much of an energy drain. But we grabbed it and we farmed it artificially on purpose. That duplication is useful to us, but not necessarily useful to the plant. So just the thought that genetic entropy applies to all living things is profound. And we've been writing about that and speaking about that for a very long time. The third way that genetics is eschatological deals with the number of offspring per female that must occur if a population is going to purge bad mutations. So just given the assumption that most mutations are slightly bad. Now, Kitely and Lynch in 2003 said that is one of the most well-established principles in evolutionary biology. Most mutations are slightly deleterious. If that's true, they have to be removed from the population. They must be. I was reading recently Bassinger et al.'s 2023 paper, Dynamical Systems and Fitness Maximization in Evolution and Biology. And they had a, a table in there, and I was reminded of in that, when I read that table of something I'd, I remember from years ago, and it's the number of offspring a female must produce given perfect selection to purge all deleterious mutation from the population every generation. And when I looked at their table, I said, oh, I'm going to graph that. And when you graph it and you round off everything to just a couple significant figures and, and set the y-intercept to zero, the slope of the line is y equals e to the x. Now, e is like pi. It's a repeating number. It's 2.7 something, not 3.14 something. It's, a, it's an ever-repeating number in mathematics that we use a lot. It appears all the time. Here it appears again. y equals e to the x is the number of offspring, y, that a female must have given a certain number of mutations that they have. That's x. So, if you have only like one mutation every generation, well, female must have, I guess, e to the one, which would be 2.7 children in order to remove that mutation and still have population left. Well, if there's something on the order of like 100 mutations per generation, like pretty much that's the modern measurement, about 100 mutations per generation, well, that's e to the 100, which is um, 10 to the 44th power. Human females can't have 10 to the 44th power offspring. I thought it was on the order of 800. That's the number that I remembered, but I was way, 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 way off. I was, uh, what, a 41 orders of magnitude off. The point is, there's no mathematical or biological way to remove the mutations that we see happening. So if all mutations are neutral, it doesn't matter. If almost all mutations are neutral, it doesn't matter because natural selection can remove a couple of mutations per generation given a lot of assumptions. But that's not what the theory is telling us. The theory is telling us that most mutations are bad. Now, even if it um, happens in the junk DNA, let's say, well, junk DNA is highly functional as far as regulating the, the rest of the genome. The protein coding regions are regulated by the non-protein coding regions. That's absolutely clear. I've talked about this on the show before. All I'm saying is this. We can see decay happening. Evolution requires that decay not happen. Decay is really happening. Evolution isn't true. Because biologically, species cannot persist under that withering blast of mutation. And if that's true, then there had to be a creator. Because if things are declining, we had to start in a place that wasn't declined. You can't get a evolution happening in a system where there's nothing but attrition. So if there was a creator, there's a time limit on biology. There's a time limit on humanity. Now, I don't know what that time limit is. We can persist for a very long time in a decrepit state. And there's 8 billion people. 8 billion people, even if our population starts to shrink, there's still going to be millions or even billions of people. It's okay. We can persist for many thousands of years in this state, even at the mutation rate we can measure. But it's not an infinite persistence. We're not going to evolve into some higher being with giant heads that live on Mars. We're, we're not going to evolve into something better. We're going to slowly decay. And that is the promise 
that the Bible makes to people. I mean, it's clear we are in a, a world subject to decay. Now, I'm going to read for you a passage. This is from 2 Peter chapter 3. I could have chosen any number of passages, but I like the 2 Peter chapter 3 passage. So Peter says this, Knowing first of all that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, they will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. That sounds like an evolutionary statement, doesn't it? All things have continued as they always have. Well, not according to the math. If you look very carefully, yeah, things have persisted for thousands of years because our genius creator God created them to survive a lot of assaults. But they're slowly decaying. They're not improving. They're not persisting. They're actually decaying. The appearance of stasis is a mirage. Peter continues. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that was existed was deluged with water and perished. Now that, of course, is referencing Noah's flood. So the earth really is old. It's thousands of years old. But it was created by God and the original world was perished or the original world perished by a flood. That's where we get the fossil record, Noah's flood and all that kind of stuff. He continues. But by the same word... The heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That doesn't mean that God created over thousands of years period in Genesis, that one day equals thousands of years. No, it means that God's wrath is delayed. God has much patience. The fact that he's been waiting to come back is his business. It's his patience. Now, we have very short lifespans. He doesn't. So to him, it hasn't been a long time. To us, it has been a long time. That's what that means. There's more. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Yes, my friends, if you're not a Christian, you're listening to this, the reason this earth still exists, one reason for that is because of you, because God wants you to come to repentance, and he's delaying coming back so that you if you're one of his children, can come into his kingdom. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. The Bible is clearly predicting the return of Jesus Christ and an end of the things that we know. The time is short. That's why this eschatological genetics. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the days of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's the eschatological promise for the Christian. A new heaven, a new earth, a new body, an existence for eternity with no sin, no death, no suffering. That's what's waiting for us. You can have that too. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found with him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. So, my friends, I hope you can see that the study of biblical genetics is a study of eschatology, and it's a study of the gospel. It's the thought that we are decrepit, we are falling apart, we are imperfect and impure, therefore we can't stand in front of the holy God. And when the day of judgment comes, it's going to be a terrible day for many people. For those people who put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ... That God who came to this earth, who died on the cross, and he paid that deathly penalty that we deserve for us in our place, we are going to be able to stand in front of God. He's going to welcome us into his kingdom. Eschatological genetics. Before I go, I just want to give a quick shout out to my friends on Patreon and buymecoffee.com for your financial support. If you'd like to help contribute to this channel, the link's in the show notes below. God bless you all.